Welcome aboard, everybody. Dr. Peter Glidden here, your steadfast advocate for health. I had the great privilege and pleasure today of interviewing Dr. Stanislaw Brzezinski, MD, PhD, from Houston, Texas. Well, he's originally from Poland, but he's been working in Houston for a number of years now. He has a very large alternative, quote unquote, cancer treatment center in Houston. And what I mean by alternative is, Dr. Brzezinski is pioneering a really quite revolutionary approach towards the treatment of cancer outside of the mainstream of conventional cancer treatment. He's been attacked by members of conventional medical cancer treatment, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to interview him in the first place. He's courageous. He's uh, a scientist. Uh, and he's been willing to stick his neck out on behalf of sick and suffering humanity. Because conventional cancer treatment fails egregiously across the board. It's unbelievably expensive and unbelievably ineffective. There are only a handful of doctors in the world who are willing to not go the way of the herd who are willing to follow the scientific method into undiscovered country. Dr. Brzezinski's research and Dr. Brzezinski's clinical uh, therapeutics are, in a word, revolutionary. And I hope that you find this interview interesting and compelling. I certainly did. It's always good to hear the same message from another person. Our message Conventional medicine does not work. Conventional medicine is a failed methodology. Conventional medicine and the treatment of chronic disease should be abandoned. Let me give you a little bit of an overview of Dr. Brzezinski's quite remarkable resume, and then we'll get right into the meat and potatoes of the interview. Stanislaw Brzezinski, internationally recognized physician and biochemist researcher, pioneered the development and use of biologically active peptides in diagnosing, preventing, and treating cancer since 1967. In 1967, at 24 years of age, Dr. Brzezinski graduated from the Medical Academy in Lublin, Poland with an MD degree with distinction finishing first in his class of 250. The following year, 1968, he earned his PhD in biochemistry as one of the youngest candidates in Poland ever to hold both an MD and a PhD. Dr. Brzezinski founded his clinic in Houston, where he's treated over 8,000 patients. Dr. Brzezinski is the author and co-author of over 300 scientific publications and presentations. In his career, he has received numerous prestigious awards from medical, educational, and governmental institutions. He holds 242 patents registered in 35 countries related to 17 proprietary scientific inventions as of January 2011. Dr. Brzezinski's basic idea here is that cancer is caused by mutated genes. There are a number of things that can cause a gene to mutate. Environmental pollution, environmental stress, physiological stress, lack of nutrients that I talk about all of the time. Once a gene has been corrupted, once a gene's uh, genetic material has become mutated, one of the results is the development of tumor cells, cancer cells. Well, Dr. Brzezinski's approach is to give therapeutic interventions tailor-made for individuals depending on their genetic component of the cancer cell. The intention of his therapy is to turn on genes which are naturally occurring in the human body which eat up cancer cells, which destroy cancer cells, which eliminate cancer cells. Fascinating stuff. I think you'll find the interview compelling, and it also supports the message that I've been trumpeting for a number of years here, that we don't have a free medical market in the United States, and we need doctors like Dr. Brzezinski. We need to support scientists like Dr. Brzezinski, who are willing 
to risk it all for the betterment of humanity who are willing to stand up and be counted, who are willing to take the road less traveled. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Stanislaw Brzezinski. Okay, so Dr. Brzezinski, if you could please bring the listening audience up to speed with just a general overview of your understanding of the genesis of cancer and what makes your treatments so unique and so different from everybody else in the world. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to the audience today and explain our research. Our uh, viewpoint of cancer is not different than the other researchers. Uh, as we know today, cancer is the disease of the genes. Abnormal genes, if we can say, conspire and they form uh, the network which is causing cancer. This is like an evil quote unquote network of numerous genes. Uh, some of these genes are simply, we can call sick genes, which are mutated, or the genes which are augmented, or which they have some other abnormal features. Uh, of course, explanation of this will go beyond what we have to say today. But the bottom line is that we are dealing with sick genes. And the number of these genes in various cancers is different. In some cancers, it could be just about 40 or 50 abnormal genes. In some others, like for instance, average breast cancer case, about 80 abnormal genes. In um, medium aggressive malignant brain tumor, it will be about 300. And in most aggressive malignancies, like glioblastoma, it will go over 600 malignant uh, abnormal genes. And these abnormal genes, they uh, say hijack normal genes, and they form a huge network of the genes which are causing the disease. The number of the genes in the network could be as high as 4,500, for instance, in such aggressive malignancies like malignant melanoma or the uh, diablastoma or GBM. But out of this uh, 4,000 plus genes which form malignant uh, network, only some of the genes are really sick, so to report, or abnormal, or mutated, etc. And uh, the number of these genes varies from about 40 to about 650, depending which malignancy we are talking about. Of course, these genes, the sick genes, are taken from our own genome of counts about 23,000 genes. So we can imagine the <laughs> combination of uh, abnormal genes is almost unlimited. And that's why every patient with cancer is about different. And cancer is not just a, a group of, say, 150 diseases. It's a group of 100,000 different diseases, which almost every patient is different. And that's why the previous methods to treat cancer, which diagnose cancer based on uh, the pictures under optic microscope, uh, which method was introduced about 1845 by the man who was born in today's Poland. But this, of course, uh, uh, diagnosis is no longer sufficient. This needs to be revised. The cancer needs to be diagnosed based on what is called genomic signature. And this genomic signature is different for every patient. So that means that we need a completely different approach to treatment. And that's what we are practicing. This is called personalized targeted therapy or precision medicine. It was born soon after the genome structure has been established. And now it's gaining speed. And most of the specialists in the field of cancer feel that this is the future of cancer treatment, the future of the treatment of chronic diseases. Simply, we need to find out 
what is causing cancer in individual patients, which means we need to identify so-called sick genes, and we need to treat the genes which are causing cancer. Once we are successful, the cancer should be eradicated in this individual patient. But this requires careful genomic analysis to find out what is causing cancer in the individual patient. And that's what we are practicing. For every patient, we are diagnosing the genes and then trying to find out which medication we have at our disposal to successfully treat this patient. Yes, well, what's, the, what's that's fascinating, really? What's the thought process behind, if there is any, what causes the genes to become mutated in the first place? Is it does your research and your therapeutic uh, uh, program of treatment take that into consideration? What's the thought behind what makes the genes become mutated in the first place? Well, this is a separate science, which is carcinogenesis. And certainly this is extremely important because certainly this is the future. Because if we know what is causing the genes to become sick, then hopefully we can prevent the disease. And this is what should be addressed in the first place. And uh, certainly there are multitude of factors which can cause genes to become sick. And obviously uh, thousands of researchers all over the world are identifying these genes. Many of these are environmental factors, many of these is what we eat, uh, a number of these is radiation, uh, cell phones, uh, computers, etc. Our lifestyle, uh, like stress, like uh, hours of sleep, whatever. Uh, thousands and thousands of different factors can cause genes to really become abnormal. And then once this happens, we can develop cancer. For instance, to give you the example, um, in China, and Southeast Asia, there's a common contaminant of food, uh, which is a fungus, which is producing aflatoxins. Uh, these are toxins which are causing cancer. And it is estimated that the number of liver cancers, uh, which will be created by aflatoxin in the next, say, 20 or 30 years, will be about 10 million. I'm talking about China and countries surrounding China. and uh, uh, the population which is exposed to these aflatoxins and there are millions of people because uh, they eat contaminated rice, they, uh, they, they drink contaminated beer, they eat uh, con uh, contaminated Beijing duck, okay? And then they get aflatoxins which ultimately can cause cancer. Not in everybody, however. And why not in everybody? Because we have defense system against cancer. Well, if we are talking about defense system, we are talking about uh, immune system, but the immune system is unable to protect us against most of the cancers. Why? You can ask the question. Because cancer cells are our own cells. Immune system cannot recognize them as foreign cells and will not fight them. So that's how cancer can avoid destruction by the immune system. Certainly, there are certain malignant cells which are so different from our normal cells that the immune system can recognize them and kill them, but it's a minority of cancers. In most of cancers, the immune system is powerless, and as a matter of fact, sometimes when the immune system goes overboard, it can create cancers like malignant lymphomas. So what kind of systems can protect us against cancer? Well, I discovered one of these systems, and this is the system of antineoplasty. Uh, thus, at the end of my medical school course, I discovered a group of 119 peptides in our body, which exist in blood, and are secreted into the urine, um, which can have activity against cancer. And I put together the theory that when we are deficient in some of these peptides, then malignant cell uh, cancers are not eradicated, they multiply and they form cancer. Well, later on, we found that uh, these chemicals, which are peptides and derivatives of amino acids, work as molecular switches. They turn on the genes which fight cancer, which are tumor suppressor genes. So this is a different defense system, which consists of genes which fight abnormal malignant, abnormal cells, malignant cells. And the most important genes is gene T53, uh, but these genes, are switched off in patients who have cancer. That's silence. So we need to use the proper switches to turn them on. When you turn them on, the cancer can go away.
And that's the principle behind what we use. I discovered antineoplasms which work as molecular switches. They turn on uh, the genes which can eradicate cancer, and then the rest, the body can handle on its own. The problem is that uh, because of our limited resources, we are able to really barely scratch the surface. We just tested primarily <laughs> uh, two of these uh, out of 119 uh, peptides and amino acid derivatives, and we brought them to phase three clinical trials because this is an extremely expensive process. We didn't have resources to do it, and uh, we know that these couple of uh, medications, which are now at the final steps of the approval, can work on 100 different genes which are involved in many different cancers. And when we use them, they can turn on the tumor suppressor genes, they can switch off the genes which are causing cancer, and the cancer goes away. But only in some patients, in the patients who have the group of the genes on which we are going to work. If you would like to treat some other cancers, you need to add some other uh, derivatives, which uh, we found some time ago with this arsenal. Hopefully, they will do the same. These are natural substances. Uh, because of this, they don't hurt our body. And uh, if we have the patient who have the right combination of genes causing cancer, the cancer goes away, and the patient is cured. How well it works? Well, we have patients who are now surviving close to 30 years tumor-free. We have the first generation of patients who came us as young people, then they got married, they had children, now they have grandchildren, and they live happy ever after. So the cancer can be cured, but not cancer as such, but some types of cancer in some people by using this approach. But if you add more medications to this arsenal, hopefully the number of people who can be successfully treated will expand. And uh, that's what we are working on, but obviously we are lonesome. Uh, we have difficulties to survive because uh, not only we are experiencing financial difficulties, but we are continuously attacked by competitors, uh, which are companies making billions of dollars on the existing drugs, and they don't want to use. They would like to use the drugs they are using now for many, many years because they are making me billions and billions of dollars in this business, and they don't want to heal, even though they know that uh, there is something which can be worked better. I get it. So I'm, with you, I'm with you 100%. So let me, see, let me see if I can encapsulate this, and correct me if I'm wrong, okay? So there are numerous processes which uh, the human body can be exposed to, things in the environment that environmental stress, electromagnetic stress, physiological stress, lack of nutrients, exposure to toxic substances in, in the world, which will make cancer cells, which will mutate genes in the body, which then create cancer. And your therapeutic approach is to upregulate other genes in the body, which eradicate and stop the, the process of tumor formation. And you do this with uh, peptides, is that correct? So if someone comes into you for a therapeutic intervention, what specifically happens to them and how do, what does the therapy look like? Well, uh, you summarize this very well, but let me uh, bring you a few other details to the discussion. Well, the body has a perfect system to protect us against cancer and some other diseases. And this is a system of genes which fight numerous diseases. Cancer is just an example. Well, in cancer, we have a group of genes which are named tumor suppressor genes. They are very effective. They can wipe out uh, any type of cancer if uh, they are active. But when the cancer develops, these genes are switched off. And our strategy is to use the genomic switch, which will turn on these genes. When the genes are active, the cancer is gone. But we have only a couple of these switches which we are using now. So this is a big field, obviously. This will take many, many years to develop, and it will require resources of many companies and many scientists all over the world. And I think this is what is going to happen in the future. What we are using, we are using the switches which naturally occur in our body and which are deficient in patients with cancer. And thus, we believe, ultimately, they develop cancer. But that's not only in cancer. Of course, people hear about a crisis 
of antibiotics. We are running out of antibiotics because the antibiotics which were isolated before initially they were very effective, but now the bacteria are becoming very smart and they build resistance and the new antibiotics are not so easy to find. These antibiotics which are introduced, they can usually as a product of fungus and uh, some uh, bacteria, whatever. Some of them are synthetically produced, but basically there is a limited arsenal of these antibiotics and now people are dying from infections. First time in many, many years because the microorganisms are becoming smart. What can be done? Well, our body possesses own antibiotics, peptide antibiotics, which are much more superior than any other antibiotics which are used before. And these antibiotics protect us against microorganisms as we live every day, okay? And these antibiotics were identified and they can be used, but of course there's a better way of using this. When bacteria invade our body, for instance, when they invade intestine and cause deadly disease like cholera, uh, they turn off the gene which is producing our own antibiotics. And then the bacteria spread, the patient dies. Uh, there's a way to turn on the gene which is making our own antibiotic and bacteria will be gone just in a few days. So that's another application of molecular switches which can treat numerous diseases, not only cancer but many other diseases, simply by exploring our, the resources of our body, by learning. How can we turn on the genes which in our body can fight the disease? But of course, we are interested primarily in cancer and that's where we are proceeding. And of course, we prove through our research that cancer can be cured, the worst type of cancer, which are uniformly deadly, which nothing can cure uh, today, can be cured by using this application. But not in every patient, but in patients with the right genomic signatures. And then of course, if we identify this, the treatment may go very well. So what does the therapeutic look like from a patient's point of view as you are attempting to turn the switch back on to uh, help the body fight bacteria or tumor cells? What does the therapeutic look like from a patient's point of view um, at your clinic? Well, that's easier than you think. And this is because of rapid development of technology uh, in the area of genomic testing. Uh, and we do only some of these tests in our laboratory, but we prefer to use outside laboratories which have much better instruments and much better expertise. Uh, when the patient comes to us, or even before the patient is coming to us, we can arrange for genomic testing. Simply the tissue which was taken from biopsy is sent to the laboratory which is running such tests. Now these laboratories are multiplying and uh, usually such testing is covered by insurance programs. Uh, when, we when we send the tissue to the laboratory, this does not mean that the patient needs to have another biopsy. Usually we see patients who had biopsy or surgery a long time ago. We simply fill the forms, email the forms to the laboratory which has the tissue. The tissue is forwarded to another lab which is running the test and we have the results. How soon? Well, from one week to three weeks. And then we know about the most important genes which are causing cancer in this particular patient. Uh, we don't test the entire genome of 23,000 genes uh, because this at this moment is not necessary. Uh, we have only a limited arsenal of medications which work on the genes. And what is tested are the genes which can be treated now. And this is about 400 different genes. When we have the results, then we find out which medication we can use to work on the disease. Of course, we look at our medications, which are antineoplastins, and we find out how many genes we can cover with our medications. Uh, we are dealing with three medications. One of these medications is already FDA approved, and uh, it can be prescribed by any doctor in the country. Two others are in the final stage of the clinical trials, and to have access to them requires some tedious procedure which is named expanded access. It needs to go through FDA, but it is feasible to obtain the permission. So then we see, can we treat these patients successfully by only using these medications? In most cases, it may be not sufficient. And then we find out 
what other medications we can add to successfully treat patients. These other medications work on the genes on which our medication doesn't work. And fortunately, currently we are approaching the number of 90 medications approved by the FDA which work on different genes, which are different than genes covered by our medication. So this means that we put together a combination. Uh, we use one of our medications plus two, three, sometimes four medications which work on the other genes. And with such combinations, we go ahead and give the treatment. So this does not include chemotherapy. It includes medications which work on the genes, which is a new class of medications. Such medications are much easier to use. They don't usually cause as bad side effects. And most of them are tablets. So it's just a matter of taking tablets a day, for instance. And uh, if you have a patient with the right uh, genomic signature, then we see tumors shrinking within one to two months. Some of these tumors are gone with, during such a period of time. The others will decrease. Uh, but we still have a small percentage of patients whom we don't see response because obviously this is not yet a perfect approach. It still needs to be <laughs> perfected in the future. But at least it gives us much better assurance that we are not going to waste time and money and we are going to have good results. So this means we would like to shrink the tumors, get rid of the tumors, then stabilize the situation to make sure that they won't come back and then we can live happy ever after. So that's uh, the treatment of a successful patient. Well, happily ever after is always uh, a good goal to have. Now, considering the fact that, you know, we don't really have a free medical market in the United States and that the, the, the delivery of medicine is more or less dictated by the American Medical Association and the pharmaceutical industry, and that the vast majority of cancer treatments here in the United States involve chemo, radiation, and surgery, I would expect that your approach with you know, turning on the genes in the body that help the body to naturally take care of uh, the tumor cell um, has met with a little bit of resistance, perhaps. What's your experience been with uh, conventional, with your own colleagues, conventional medical doctors, uh, oncologists, uh, and their understanding of your therapeutics? What's that been like for you? Well, uh, in order to avoid uh, criticism, uh, we prefer to treat patients who try practically any treatment possible, and nothing works. So a number of the patients who come to us were simply sent to hospice because they went to the best place in the world, and there's nothing else which could work. So then, in such patients, we feel that we can use the new approach because nothing works, and uh, we feel that if we run the gene testing, we find out that we have proper uh, combination of genes which can be successfully treated, then we should not have as much resistance. What we do, we have terrible resistance, and uh, we are attacked mercilessly by Texas Medical Board. Previously, we were attacked by FDA, but now <laughs> we uh, have so-called peace with FDA, and we work together. But Texas Medical Board would like to get rid of us and the doctors to work, despite of the fact that we have evidence of great success. We prove that uh, by using this approach in the worst type of cases, in cancers, like for instance, advanced pancreatic cancer, which spread all over the body, advanced colon cancer, advanced lung cancer type like malignant mesothelioma, uh, highly malignant brain tumors. We have our survival which is at least twice as good as in any other treatment available. So we proved this by statistical evaluation of the results on the patients who are treated by us. Uh, so th this is regarding statistics. So uh, we proved that we can save a lot of, of these people. Despite of this, we are mostly attacked by Texas Medical Watch, which would like to get rid of us. Why? I think they use old communist strategy. I grew up in the communist country, and everybody knows that the common economy in the communist country is good for nothing. If you compare the economy in the communist country to the country across the border, <laughs> it looks very shabby. There is shortage of everything, okay? But across the border, this, <laughs> you can find everything available, okay? 
So that's why the communists, because they cannot match what is across the border, they would like to conquer the world, they would like to destroy uh, what is better than in uh, their system, because the comparison looks awful. And that's why the Soviet Union was continuously advancing and making life miserable in Central Europe, in Asia, and everywhere else. Okay. Uh, but uh, they would like to do it because they couldn't really uh, bring economy to match economy in the other country. They wanted to destroy it. That's why Texas Medical Board would like to destroy our clinic because we look better than the guys <laughs> across the street. We have better survival, we have better results, and the comparison looks bad. So the guys across the street who are taking billions of dollars from the government may not be able to get billions of dollars anymore because we will ask questions. So the best is to get rid of us is part of the fact that we are saving thousands of human lives. So I believe that's the principle. But the name of the game is a dirty business practices because they know that the other guys are making a lot of money and they would like to get rid of us so that the other big institutions will make a lot of money for a long period of time, but the people will die. Thousands of them will die and they may be helped the other institutions will accept our approach. Certainly, I believe that the truth is going to win, ultimately, and uh, the people who are causing such problems will be taken to justice. But unfortunately, this time, we have to suffer. And uh, very few people are willing to help us because they believe uh, in the system, but the system is crooked. The system works for the big corporations, for the big money, <laughs> not really to save the life of the people. It's a fascinating, uh, you know, kind of condemnation or observation of the sociological system that we find ourselves in. It reminds me of Max Planck, one of Einstein's contemporaries. One of his most famous quotes was, science progresses one funeral at a time. It becomes very difficult for generational ideas to be left behind. And I think there's a lot of closed-mindedness and also intellectual cowardice which is present not only in the medical system but in the scientific community at large. It's always amazing to me that men and women who espouse themselves to be scientists, who hold themselves out to the community as being upholders of the scientific method, and we have to double-blind placebo control and test everything and verify it with the scientific method, which is a great thing to do, but when scientific testing, when placebo-controlled trials, when scientific published research proves that there's something other than what they're doing is effective, it, it, it is mind-boggling to me that the new ideas advanced by men and women of true science are met with such harsh opposition across the board. Um, I really think that there is an element of cowardice here. I also think that there is an element of people are just unwilling to let go of the financial gain that they're experiencing from their therapeutics and they turn a blind eye to the suffering and the complete abject ineffectiveness of their therapeutics it's a remarkable phenomenon to me, and quite frankly, um, you know, it's, it's doctors like yourself, really, that are going to make the difference here, and I really have to applaud you for standing up in the face of such intellectual cowardice. I'm wondering if you think that in your lifetime, there's going to be a dramatic sea change here. Considering where you started, and where you're at now, what do you project for the future as far as advancing new ideas for cancer treatment? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, the empires are aging, and the United States also follows the same course. You have different types of people living in America now than 100 years ago. You have less pioneering spirit than what you had before. People are spoiled by easy life. They are certain way demoralized. It's nothing unusual. It always happens in big empire. Why America has a better chance? Because America has continuous influx of immigrants. And these immigrants can make difference. 
because uh, they are more energetic, they experience a lot of troubles in their life, and they are willing to challenge, and they are willing to introduce new things. So I think America has much better chance than, for instance, big empire like Roman Empire, which collapsed on its way, it, it degenerated because ultimately the people have such luxury that uh, really they became demoralized, they didn't want to fight anymore, <laughs> and the empire collapsed, okay, and it's nothing unusual. Every big empire ultimately collapsed and the new country was born on uh, the ruins of the old empire. So, unfortunately, what I experienced is that in America you have abundance of bright people and people who have a pioneering spirit. Much more in America than in Europe, for instance. But these people, they are really afraid to really stand up. I experienced that one out of 20 oncologists whom I encountered would like to work with us. We are treating patients together. Uh, we have a group of perhaps 150 oncologists all over the country, and these are among the best oncologists you can get. Okay? And they are working with us. We are treating numerous patients together, but they don't want to do it openly. Only some of them are willing to stand up. Because if they do it openly, they be immediately attacked by the other guys in their community, and they be disciplined. They may be destroyed. Okay, and this happens all the time. Uh, we have people from National Cancer Institute who have seen the best results of the treatment of brain tumors in our patients they ever seen in their life, and they stand up. But then they were silenced because they were told that the job will be in jeopardy they be terminated, whatever. So uh, they are exposed to immediate attack by what I would say totalitarian medicine. And that's what we have. We have a totalitarian medicine which dictates to the doctors what they should do. Every patient should be treated the same way. They should use uh, medications which are put together by the lawyers from FDA, from the National Cancer Institute. And basically the doctors work under supervision of the lawyers, of uh, the bureaucrats from central agencies, and they have very little freedom. If they try to do something else, they will be eliminated. Okay? And this is to uphold the system of the great monopolies, great pharmaceutical companies, great hospitals, which really are making a lot of money on the status quo. And that's what exists. And the doctors are not brave enough to stand up and say, enough, we know better how to treat people, and we should have the final voice. And this is what was called previously art of practice in medicine. This has been destroyed by totalitarian medicine. What was, in, what was introduced was some type of communist medicine where every patient should be treated the same way and obviously it failed miserably and it caused the government tremendous amount of money. So that's sorry state of a first now. But hopefully in America it may change, but the change will not come easily. I think thousands of people are dying needlessly because the system perpetuates, okay? But ultimately, it should be presented to the public. And I think the people should demand the change. In America, they can force the change. The new system needs to be introduced, and this new system can work much, much better and save thousands of lives. Well, my friends are saying that uh, it won't happen in my lifetime, that <laughs> after I die, my ideas will be accepted. Oh, I do know. Uh, among other things I am doing, I embark on anti-aging research, uh, and I have some success. So hopefully I can live long enough to introduce my idea to final approval. Uh, I think we are coming close. <laughs> Ultimately, I am in medicine now uh, for 47 years, and uh, I am still doing very well. And I believe I'm willing long enough to see the approval. This is what my friends advised me at the very beginning. If you like to make a breakthrough, start very early because you have to outlive your opponents. Ultimately, they will never yield. You have to outlive them, then the idea will be accepted. We are coming to this point. We are coming to this point. Okay? But it will be a fierce battle. I hope you will see this. And ultimately, this idea, this statement, will be accepted because this is the treatment which works. And this is the idea which works. Many oncologists are saying that what we do now uh, will be practiced 10 years from now by big medical institutions. And I'm sure they are right, okay? And I'm sure this will get 
sooner than that, okay? because ultimately, whatever is right will be interviewed. Well, you know, it's interesting. Years ago, uh, over 200 years ago, Dr. Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, said that unless we put medical freedom into the Constitution, the time will come when medicine will organize itself into a dictatorship and restrict the art of healing to one class of men, and such laws will uh, constitute the Bastille of uh, American medicine. And that's exactly what's happened here for for whatever reason, medicine as it has evolved here has somehow become the exclusive domain of allopathic reductionistic thought. And allopathic reductionistic thought is really, really good for pulling bullets out of arms, for sewing up lacerations, fixing broken bones, a handful of infections. But for chronic disease, the approach does not work. While we have been laboring underneath this regime, this oppressive, totalitarian medical model, type 2 diabetes, obesity, autism, cancer, heart disease, they're rising. They're not getting better. They're getting worse. And it's my belief and the belief of many of my naturopathic colleagues that it's not because the medical system is corrupt it's not because of the pharmaceutical interests. Well, you know, that has something to do with it. But when you dial it down to the brass tacks, the, the motive reason here, the fundamental reason is that the reductionistic allopathic method for chronic disease does not work. It's the wrong method. And it needs to be abandoned. And new ideas need to come into the treatment zone, and it's just extremely frustrating. And I feel your frustration because as a member of the naturopathic medical community, for instance, in the state of Washington, I'm allowed to perform minor surgery, deliver babies, prescribe drugs, call myself a physician, order any diagnostic test I want, and it's all covered by insurance. But if I was to move a few states over, it's illegal for me to practice medicine, and that's just not right. And so there is a struggle here, but I believe that, you know, at least I have to hope, as I believe you do, that ultimately the truth will out and that people will gradually migrate away from therapeutics that don't work and towards therapeutics that do work. The biggest stumbling block here, I believe, is education. Most people are completely unaware that your clinic exists. Most people don't even know how to pronounce the word naturopathic, let alone know what it does. And so this is the reason I've put together this educational series that I'm promoting to help spread the word to whomever is wise enough to hear that there do in fact exist right now in real time, science-based, clinically verified alternatives to conventional therapeutics that actually make a difference and quite frankly, Dr. Brzezinski, uh, you know, I've, I'm very inspired by you and by your story and by your history. Uh, I don't know why it's such a struggle here to bring therapeutics, which are science-based, clinically verified, published and proven in, into the marketplace. But, you know, we have to continue to do it because, well, it's, we have our fingers on the truth. And, you know, yeah, it's, uh, it's, right. it's only a matter of time. Yeah, absolutely right. Obviously, in order to treat successful cancer, we need to give freedom to the doctors. Doctors don't have freedom. Doctors are working on the dictatorship of lawyers and clerks. And uh, they, many of them knew that by using some innovation which they acquired after years of practice, they can save human lives. They are prohibited to do it because they will be severely punished, okay? And that's horrible. And who are the guardians of the totalitarian medicines? Well, it's very much like if you look at the movie <laughs> Cowboys and Aliens, okay? Here, on one side, you have high technology. On the other hand, you have cowboys and you have bad cowboys. You don't have John Wayne type of cowboys. You have evil cowboys who knows very little about this technology, but who are the puppets in the hands of very smart people behind, who are evil, 
and who would like to perpetuate making billions of dollars for many, many years to come. You have an army of idiots who are working for uh, very smart people who are running the show, okay? And these idiots could be very effective in destroying high technology. They know nothing about it and are simply obeying the orders. Uh, there will be a year, there may be a time when they be taken to justice because what they do, they are the punishment of something which is evil, okay? And uh, this happened in Germany before World War II. Thousands and thousands of people, uh, law-abiding citizens, were used to really commit horrible crimes because they were simply obeying orders. In the United States also you have a number of great attorneys, quote-unquote, great class, great bureaucrats who are simply obeying orders, and by doing this, they are contributing to the deaths of thousands and thousands of people. And this should be stopped, this should be avoided, this should be exposed. And it won't be exposed until American people will learn what is going on. That's why your program is very important, because it can bring the light what is going on, and that most of the people, they don't have any idea. They are silent, they are put to sleep, and when the time comes, they have a very serious disease, and they are dying from it, because whatever is available is not going to help them much, okay? So that's the problem, you see. But hopefully, as the time goes by, uh, the people will see what is going on, and they will take uh, really the action in, your, in the, their own hands. Dr. Brzezinski, uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, you really are an inspiration to talk to. Uh, you know, just is there anything you'd like to add as a parting shot? Well, uh, basically, under these difficult circumstances, we are trying to practice medicine uh, the best we can. Uh, obviously, we are seeing a lot of patients, and uh, we see very good results. Uh, we are trying to evaluate quickly what can we do to individual patients and proceed with the treatment. And in most cases, we see improvement during the first month or two, especially in the area of malignant brain tumors on which we concentrated, especially in such horrible malignant brain tumors as glioblastoma. We publish our results, and in most of the patients whom we are treating now, we see tumor shrinkage during the first two months of treatment. And then the tumor usually goes away. And this is in people who tried therapy, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, and after that they were told that the nothing can be done for them. So we are still trying to do to help numerous human lives, and we are fully active, and we believe that ultimately the truth is going to win. So if somebody would like to find out what we can do for them, please contact us. We have our contact information, and we will get to see what we can do. Dr. Brzezinski, it really is, has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure.